When I started my smart home journey many years ago, I made mistakes. Mistakes that would cost me time and money. Mistakes that would frustrate my family and ultimately make it harder to get a smart home accepted by them. In this video, I'm gonna go through five of the mistakes I made and what I did about it, so that hopefully you don't make the same ones as well. Hey everyone and welcome to a new video on Bite of Geek. So in this video I'm going to go through five of the mistakes that I made when I first started creating my smart home. Uh, these were you know things that I just didn't realize at the time and I suspect many people will have done similar kinds of things as they've started on their smart home journey. Um, I'm sure some people will have avoided all of this with the hours and hours and hours worth of reading and investigations and stuff like that um, feel free to drop uh, your advice down below in the comments if you've gone down that route um, but i think this some of this stuff is fairly common and many people will have gone down uh, and, and made similar kind of mistakes so the first one is uh, what i would call ecosystems uh, so i'm generalizing a lot of stuff here um, now, what do I mean by ecosystems? Well, you know, it's more than just kind of like your Google Home and your Amazon Alexas and all that kind of stuff. Um, everybody probably will have gone and started with some kind of smart speaker. Yeah, maybe they've got something from Apple. Um, yeah, and then realized kind of like some of the limitations of that. I mean, I still use my Amazon devices to this day, uh, you know, how long that will carry on given the rumors of uh, you know what what they are look, looking to introduce i don't know but that's what i have in my uh, house at the moment and, and it's part of my smart home ecosystem um, i think the the bit that builds upon that is really the devices that you start attaching to that like many people i will have gone and started with things like bulbs and plugs uh, to try and automate some of those devices and, and lighting around the house. Uh, you know, great to talk to your smart speaker and get it to turn on the lights, get it to turn on the television and things like that. Um, really simple, straightforward things to go and do. Um, but one of the things that, uh, as part of that, um, and really I think is the driver, the cost was the driver on this. You know, plugs were very expensive, so you know, when you you saw cheaper plugs, you bought those, and ultimately you end up with a whole bunch of different uh, devices from different manufacturers um, that don't necessarily all play with each other. Um, and and you know, this isn't necessarily uh, a super bad uh, thing to have done, but ultimately what I have ended up with is I have ended up with devices that I no longer use. Um, because of the direction that I have taken later on in my smart home decisions. Um, one of the other things that comes with doing that, you know, with having your, your, uh, you know, your, your, your Tapo or TP-Link uh, smart plugs, your Toya devices, your bulbs, you know, all the different varieties of, uh, of those devices, your, um, you know, your switches, all that kind of stuff, is that you end up with this huge collection of apps that end up on your uh, mobile device, whether that's a phone or a tablet that you're gonna use. You've got logins everywhere, you know, keeping track of all of that. It's just an absolute nightmare. And so what you end up with, uh, you know, this point of you creating your smart home is that you're, you're almost entirely dependent upon the thing that is then uh, taking that in. in. In my case, that would have been the Amazon Alexa. When you're thinking about how you are building out your smart home and the devices that you're going to use, cost shouldn't always be the driver. Um, you know, there are pros and cons to that. Uh, you know, everybody loves to get a bargain, um, but ultimately, you know, getting this, the same kind of brand of uh, product um, you know, will make your life a little bit easier. If, if anything, just to cut down the number of apps that you've actually got to use. That was probably one of my first mistakes. You know, I have a drawer full of uh, devices, um, mainly bulbs and, uh, you know, various other um, sensors and things like that, that I no longer use because they, 
they're just not, they don't fit in with where I am now. Uh, and that's a costly mistake from that point of view. So for mistake number two is gonna be my Wi-Fi router. Now, uh, this hasn't got anything to do with the Wi-Fi devices themselves, the smart plugs and the bulbs and stuff like that. This is purely to do with the router. And what I would say is that like many people who they get their broadband connection and they get a router supplied by that uh, broadband supplier, um, it, it works great. You know, you connect your TV, uh, you know, your games consoles, your mobile phone, your tablet, etc. All of those work fine. Um, you know, you may experience poor Wi-Fi depending upon kind of like your house size and construction, uh, you know, Things don't, you know, work super well in the far corners of your house, um, but that's what you've got. And then you start building a smart home on top of that. Uh, you know, you start adding your bulbs and you add in your sockets and things like that. And you wonder why things don't work 100% of the time. Maybe a bulb doesn't turn it on when you are asking your smart speaker to go and turn it on, you know, because why, why would it? You know, your mobile phone had a really poor wi-fi connection in in that part of the house as well so you know that's that's kind of like going to be the same kind of issue for your smart devices uh you know one of the things with your router that's supplied by your broadband supplier um is that they're just not great to be honest um you know these are mass produced the cheapest of the cheap um and you know they're giving you enough to use their services so inevitably, most of these routers will have uh, a maximum connected device limit of like 20 devices. Now, you know, if you've got your games consoles, your phones, your, your tablet, your television on there, you could quite easily have already gone and exceeded 10 or so devices. Uh, so it doesn't really leave that much room for bulbs and plugs, uh, you know, to go into your smart home. And once you start hitting that limit, you know, you've got other things going on. You know, the processor in them isn't the best. Uh, you know, it starts to get bogged down. You start to get delays uh, in your smart devices. Um, you know, and it's, it's just a mess. So one of the best things I did recently was to get my own uh, Wi-Fi router. Um, yeah, I had to do that. I changed broadband supplier. They don't supply a router, so I had to pick one uh, from the the masses of them off of Amazon. Um, I didn't go overboard. I didn't get, you know, ubiquity equipment or stuff like that. I, I don't need it. I, but I, what I do need is a good, solid Wi-Fi router that will bounce the signal all over the house. Uh, we'll be able to take lots of connections. Um, and I opted for a, a TP-Link router. The, you know, there'll be a link down below in the description if you want to have a look at that. But it has a solid processor on it. Uh, you know, it's able to handle all the devices that I can throw at it. Um, well, one of the things that's really uh, nowadays important on, on these kinds of things is that I can separate out the, uh, the smart devices onto their own network. So uh, historically, you probably would have gone and used maybe kind of like your guest, um, yeah, guest account that's on your Wi-Fi to, to go and separate out the devices. This, this router actually has 2.4 and five gigahertz bands purely for IoT devices. Um, so, you know, that is a good level of separation. But ultimately, the whole thing here was that move away from, uh, you know, effectively not a brilliant Wi-Fi uh, to something that is more stable um, and I get less problems with any of the Wi-Fi devices that I have connected in my smart home. So my third mistake was Home Assistant. And well, just before you all start typing away in the comments below, calling me all names under the sun and stuff like that, um, I'm not going where you think I'm going with this. Um, what I mean by Home Assistant is the way I approached Home Assistant. Now, I did a video about realities of Home Assistant a while ago. Um, let's just say a lot of people got very excited about that video. Um, there's a link up above if you want to go and watch it or if you want a bit of a, a giggle, you can go and read some of the comments. Um, but, you know, some of that still stands true to today. Uh, the, the mistake that I made with Home Assistant, so before I did that video, I had previously used Home Assistant, um, but with, you know, work commitments, life commitments, just, you know, family commitments, all that kind of stuff, all those things, the day-to-day, 
uh, I probably didn't give Home Assistant that initial uh, amount of time that it probably needed. Now, uh, I can see some of the comments already starting to be typed out. Um, you know, what you want about, you know, you just need to install it and it will create a dashboard and all your smart devices will appear there. That's fine. That is absolutely true. There is no, no kind of like disagreement with that from me. Um, what I probably did, maybe I was a bit too ambitious in what I was trying to achieve with my first steps with Home Assistant. Um, you know, you, you've got this software which is super powerful, super flexible, uh, you know, allows you to do an awful lot and, you know, you've got all these smart devices that it's kind of found and, but you just want to automate everything, don't you? You know, you want to get everything working in your house the way you have a, a vision of it all working in the first steps of your smart home journey. And I think that was probably one of the mistakes that I made there just being a bit too ambitious. Uh, you know, I think the reality is with all those different uh, applications for all the different ecosystems, the first step should have been just having uh, Home Assistant create that dashboard, allowing me to get rid of all those apps and just use the Home Assistant app to go and control those devices. That probably would have been a bit more sensible and then start to build upon uh, you know, those first steps and build out the smart home. And that's very much where I am nowadays. You know, you've seen some of the videos that I've done. You know, I'm doing more of the, the more ambitious stuff uh, that I want to try and achieve within my home. So mistake number four is to do with Zigbee. Uh, and this is basically, you know, at some point in time, I decided that I wanted to have Zigbee as my primary smart home uh, network protocol. Um, you know, and I promptly went out and I bought a Sonoff dongle and I bought Akara uh, temperature sensors and, you know, door sensors and Toya uh, controllers, all those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, got it all set up in Home Assistant and it looked great. The coordinator was at one end of the, the map and all these devices were all shooting off the coordinator. It, everything was connected. It was brilliant. Uh, but over time, you know, I noticed every so often a temperature sensor would disconnect off the network and you know other things wouldn't be working properly and um, you know it was very very odd uh, and so at that point I started reading up a bit more about you know end devices the routers and realized that my Zigbee map that effectively looked like some kind of meteorite coming into Earth's atmosphere uh, really wasn't the best uh, network mesh uh, for, for Zigbee really um, and, you know, the, the thing is, the, all these temperature sensors, the door sensors, you know, these are all end devices, they're all battery operated devices, so they can't effectively be part of, um, you know, an ongoing mesh in the Zigbee network, because the batteries have just run out. Uh, so I needed to introduce, um, you know, more devices which were routers, so that's uh, bulbs and uh, plugs, things like that, you know, even my pet feeder, uh, is a router and so ultimately you know I've gone from something as I say you know that looks like a meteorite um, into something that has a bit more of a ball shape a bit more of a globe shape in it uh, you know the network still isn't perfect there are still other devices uh, that need to uh, be reconfigured um, but uh, and I still have things which aren't connected properly or batteries uh, you know, drained and they've dropped off but it is getting there and what I have noticed is that the, uh, the Zigbee network itself is a much more uh, stronger and resilient network and devices don't really drop off uh, to, the, to the frequency that I had previously. So you know, if you are building the Zigbee network as part of your uh, home uh, automation system, your smart home system, uh, is to not build it all with end devices. You know, make sure you've got some router devices in there as well. So my fifth mistake is what I'm going to call manual automations. Now, uh, it sounds like a bit of a contradiction there, but what I'm talking about here is that act of, uh, you know, that flicking the switch on the light switch to go and turn on the light. I'm moving that from that process to you talking to a smart speaker to go and turn on the light. Um, now, many, many people will be more than happy with that as part of their smart home. 
because it's great. It's automatically doing something for you, except you're still having to do it. You know, you're still having to instruct it to go and do it. You flicking the switch is you effectively instructing that light switch to go and turn on the light. Um, there are an awful lot of people who believe that smart homes shouldn't have that level of interaction, that actually smart homes just do things for you once you've got it set up. These things just happen. Uh, and that's where, with my use of Home Assistant, you know, I am transitioning my uh, smart home away from into something that is a bit more, uh, you know, it just happens around me. So, you know, before sunset of an evening, my lounge lights, uh, you know, they all turn on and they turn off later on. I don't have to ask my um, Echo to go and do that. My curtains and blinds, uh, you know, they open and close sunset and sunrise. It's super quiet in the morning with those switch bot uh, curtain drivers. Uh, you know, especially when it's on creep mode, you know, you just wake up to the, the lovely sunshine when we get that in the UK. And things like in the kitchen, you know, LED lights on the kitchen cabinets that are using a sensor to, uh, you know, to come on and go off when somebody goes into the kitchen, you know, without having to turn on switches to it to make this kind of thing happen. Even, you know, down to my pet feeder, <laughs> which, uh, you know, if somebody came up with a pet feeder that managed to do wet food, um, as effectively as the Acara pet feeder does dried food, I, I would buy that. Um, but at the moment, you know, for dried food, I'm using that. And, you know, that's great. You know, it's an automation. It takes something away. You know, I don't have to think about it other than to fill it up, um, you know, when it starts to get low. So that's what I'm talking about with manual automations. It's kind of, you know, thinking about what you want to achieve with your smart home. If you're happy with just talking and instructing your devices, then that's fine. You know, nobody's gonna, gonna argue with that. But if you are wanting ultimately for things to just happen around you, then start to do that, you know, and build that out first rather than go the other way. Um, because obviously, you know, you'll waste time and effort having to change all that over at a later date. So there you go, they're just some of the mistakes that I have made on my smart home journey. I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts down below in the comments. Uh, you know, what mistakes have you made? I'm sure nobody's perfect. You've done similar kinds of things. Drop them down below in the comments. Um, but you know, if you've enjoyed this video, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Uh, you know, it really does help with uh, YouTube's algorithms and engagement on the channel. So thanks to everybody who uh, does that. Uh, but as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.